I'm talking all the time about love, about the men I've been with, then left, or the men who've left me, as if my emotional life alone and nothing else could touch other people. It's because for me the only thing real in my life has been love and my songs. But for me, my songs are also love. For other people, though, they are all the money they've earned for me. And I know what people say. Whatever must Piaf have earned, she must have a nice bit of money put away. She needn't worry about her old age. That's how it ought to be, I agree. In fact, I've earned a great fortune, millions, more than a thousand million, perhaps. I've already said so. I've received fabulous fees. My records alone earned me more than 30 million francs in old money a year. In New York, I was worth a million for one evening. Yes, I should possess the fortune of someone like Maurice Chevalier or Fernandel. But the unbelievable fact is this. I have hardly anything left. Just enough to live on for a few more months. And if I were never to sing again, I would have difficulty in living decently. Only I have no right to complain. If I've thrown away a fortune, it's been my fault entirely. It's because of my mania for grand excessive gestures. I'm not very proud to admit it, but if I hadn't wasted money so often, I could have carried out so much good around me. For instance, in order to please a man whom I knew to be vain, at a certain period I bought some very beautiful jewelry. Of course, it did not make me more beautiful, but it dazzled him, and that was all I wanted. It didn't prevent him from leaving me, naturally. To be more precise, he just dropped me, and in terrible circumstances. I was disgusted. So, do you know what I did? I took my necklace, my two rings, my bracelet and a clip, and I threw them into the W.C. Out of sheer fury, a fortune disappeared down the drain. It would be difficult to do anything more stupid, and you must think that I deserve to be slapped. Yes, I do, but when I'm angry, I have no self-control. Naturally, I've also wasted a lot of money with the grand couturier. You always believe that a dress designed by Dior or Balmain is going to wipe out the mistakes of nature. Unfortunately, not. When I went to the fashion houses, I was the ideal prey for the sales staff. They would come up to me and eat time they would say, Madame, how this fabric suits you, or else this color is really for you. And every time I would reply, I'll have it. In less than an hour, I had spent three or four million francs. As for the gowns, I never wore them. As soon as they left the couture houses, they lost their magic, and I would go back to my classic little black dresses. There was also the disastrous business of my house at Boulogne-sur-Seine. I had bought it for 17 million, and I'd spent a fortune to have it decorated by the greatest designer in Paris. I had an amazing drawing room and a dream bedroom entirely in blue satin. But I never slept in this bedroom. It was too beautiful, too big, too rich for me. I was not used to that sort of thing. I didn't feel at ease. I preferred to use the concierge's lodge. <laughs> a lodge that had been barely repainted and barely furnished. But I felt safe there, and it amused me to play with the cord. In the end, three years later, I sold my house. At a loss, naturally. I received only ten million francs. It's always the same with me. People think it's Edith Piaf. She's got money. We can ask what we like. I'm so naive and stupid it would make you cry. I always buy under the impression that I'm 
doing good business. I sell at any old price. A few years ago, I said to myself, I'm going to rear cows. It was the fashion in my circle. All the stage people were taking up farming. I lost almost everything on that deal. At Le Allier, near Dreux, I bought a farm for 15 million francs. In four years, it produced two kilos of haricots verts, a pound of strawberries, and a few tomatoes. We reared two hens, a rabbit, and all the cats from round about. The central heating cost me more than a million and a half, but it never worked. Whenever I wanted to take a bath, my cook, Suzanne, would heat huge saucepans of water over a wood fire. It was so cold at my farm that I never went there in winter. I sold it all for nothing when I was at death's door, and I hadn't a sou left with which to pay the nursing home and the doctors. The sad thing is, is that I never think either about what things cost. One day, for instance, I fell ill in Stockholm. I felt dizzy and sick. I was in such a panic at the idea of dying far away from Paris that I hired a DC-4 just for myself. It was obviously ridiculous and cost me the grand total of two and a half million. It's always the same story. Louis Barrier, my faithful Lulu, my impresario, would tear his hair when he looked at my bank account. There was never anything in it. But I would shrug my shoulders. Don't worry, I'd say to him. Miracles do happen. In actual fact, I'd earned money too easily. In 1957, in New York, when I left the clinic, I found all my musicians very depressed. Lulu gave me the sad news. The fees charged by the clinic, three million had left us all broke. The musicians were eating canned food and earned enough to live on by playing in dance halls. Nobody had enough money to pay their fare back home. I could hardly stand, but I only had to sing two evenings to put us back on an even keel again. When we reached Paris, Lulu sank down into a chair. Edith, he said, this can't go on. We must make some economies. I burst out laughing. Economies! Whatever next! A money box? This evening we'll invite all the musicians round and we'll celebrate. I had just opened the envelope on top of the pile of letters that had arrived during my absence. It was a letter from my record company. With it was a check for ten million. Lulu was overwhelmed. He gazed at me without saying a word. Oh, poor Lulu! Being my treasurer, my mentor, was obviously no sinecure. But it wasn't only my whims which ruined me. On top of that, I've often wasted money on behalf of my friends. That's something I don't regret. In my house at Boulogne, I would have eight people staying at a time. My friends would sleep on camp beds, inflatable mattresses, divans, or in two armchairs facing each other. My drawing room looked like a dormitory. There were composers, librettists, singers... We worked, chatted, and lived it up until dawn when we all went to bed. Yes, I've always enjoyed being generous towards my colleagues. Who else would I have helped? And giving pleasure to others warms your heart so much. How could I ever account for the gifts I've given, great and small? I think I've even given cars, just like that, for no reason, to young men just because they were good chaps. They'd been nice to me, and also because I like to see sudden joy on the faces of others. Perhaps it's because I've been so deprived of happiness myself that I need to act like Father Christmas. Now, have I been paid back in return? Let's be frank. No. It's inevitable, moreover. I've no resentment towards anyone. In any case, I don't regret the help I gave to one friend. You all know him because he's one of the greatest composers of today, Charles Aznavour. We met by seeing each other through the window. He was living opposite me. He would sing, accompanying himself on the piano. He sang beautifully. I leaned out of the window. We chatted. When I found out that he didn't have a bean, I said to him, Come and live in my house. 
When I realized he was unhappy because he had an ugly nose, I began to laugh. Don't worry, I'll pay for you to have a new one, old chap. He didn't forget. On the evening when he came, became famous, while everyone was acclaiming him, he shut himself in his dressing room and wrote to me, Edith, I've won through at last. I wanted you to know that all the applause I've received, I owe to you. I want you to have it. I kept that letter. Poor Charles. How happy he was on the evening when he was able to invite me to dinner for the first time. At that period, he was enjoying a triumphant success at the Alhambra. He went to have, we went to have supper together with some friends, and I saw him paying the bill while we were still eating. I've waited years, he admitted to me later, to do this. When I was in a spot, I always said to myself, later I shall invite Edith out. And he's richer than I am. If money has always slipped through my fingers, I haven't always thrown it away stupidly. I think I've said enough unpleasant things about myself to be allowed this little onset of vanity. Once, a few years ago, I was singing at the ABC. I went out one evening to drink coffee at a bar just a stone's throw from the music hall. It was I was leaning against the counter when I saw a woman, enveloped in a raincoat, go along the street. She was carrying a bundle in her arms. This fleeting apparition would not have attracted my attention if I had not seen the young woman's expression. She looked haunted, desperate. I didn't move. I wondered what could be tormenting her to that extent when suddenly she came back past the cafe. She was walking away quickly. She seemed to be making an escape and her arms were empty. I went out. I went down the dark alleyway, looking into every nook and cranny, all at once in the corner of a doorway. I found the bundle. It was a little fruit carton, lined with bits of rag, and in it, sleeping like an angel, was a newborn baby. I turned on my heel and ran like a maniac. My luck, by luck, I found the unhappy young woman. I caught hold of her arm. Go back for her, I ordered her. You should be ashamed of what you've done. I insulted her, and she began to cry. Don't call the police, she begged. Don't call them, I beseech you. She kept on repeating. I took her back to the alley. I placed her child in her arms and made her tell me her story. It was the usual story, of course. She had been seduced. She had had this baby. The father had abandoned her and she had been thrown out by her family without a single sou. I began to cry in my turn. She was so young. She was not yet nineteen. She was thin and small. I said, wait for me here. I went back to my dressing room. I wrote out a check, came down again as fast as I could. I put the check in her hands. Never despair again. If one day you need something, knock at my door. I will, it will be opened, and my house will be yours. She looked at the check, and she saw a million francs. I heard her say, oh, madame, madame. Then she fled. But two years later, she wrote to me. She had got married. She had called her little daughter, Edith, in the envelope, was a lucky medallion with two words on, only engraved on the back. Thank you. I still have this medallion. And yet once in my life I was mean, but I was so severely punished for it that it became no doubt the cause of my crazy generosity. It happened during the occupation. I had a debt to repay, a vast debt, but I wasn't worried about it. The fee from a new engagement would allow me to discharge it easily. Unfortunately, on the evening I was due to make my debut, the Germans closed the cabaret where I was appearing. In a panic, I wondered where to find this huge sum I needed. Then I remembered that one of my old admirers had once said to me, If you ever need anything, no matter what, you can always ask me. I went to see him. I told him the story. The next day he invited me to lunch and gave me the total amount of my debt. 
I began to sing again. I paid my benefactor, and then peace returned. I began to earn a lot of money again. For the first time in my life, I bought gold bars, which I looked at during the night and hid under my bed. And then one day, the man who had come to my rescue during the war telephoned me. Edith, I'm setting up a marvelous business, but I'm short of a certain sum of money. Can you in your turn help me? I knew that he would repay me as soon as he could. I had only to sell my gold in order to settle the matter, but those diabolical gold bars fascinated me. So aware that I was behaving shamefully, I replied to my savior, No, I'm sorry, I can't, and I hung up. I'm forced to believe in imminent justice, for this famous gold slipped through my fingers without any hope of its return. Two weeks later, the man with whom I was living at that time left my house without a word of warning. He took with him not only my illusions, but all my gold. Those horrible gold ingots. I didn't lodge a complaint over this theft. I thought that God was punishing me for having sinned just once, the only time in my life against the finest virtue in the world, generosity. Generosity.